we started off a couple of just two months time we received news of uh, one of our very dear friend who has contributed a lot towards EPCC's uh, you know our, our building development our building construction uh, his son who was a pilot uh, was uh, involved in a crash that took place uh, somewhere just off the Subang airport. Uh, he was a pilot training another trainee pilot and the crash actually killed both of them and it came to us as a shock knowing Daniel, Daniel, the pilot who, who perished was a very a faithful helper when we were setting up many of our sound system and our AV system when we moved in or even our previous building. It was such a big loss. And we, a couple of weeks ago, we heard another young man, only 32 years old, just after finished work, went back home, slept and never woke up. Came to us as a shock. And I was speaking to another church member of ours in, um, from the Mandarin section, uh, whose son was only 19 years old. Uh, just collapsed and just passed away. And we had Pastor Mark Drake. Some of you know Pastor Mark Drake. Pastor Mark Drake was uh, a speaker in our church many times. I've uh, spoken in our congregations, in all the congregations from the, from the United States, from St. Louis, Missouri. His uh, son-in-law, uh, Aaron, was... Uh, we, Susie and I, we visited their home uh, we met them, met Aaron. Aaron is only about late 30s, you know, after a soccer game. Uh, was coming back home, uh, just uh, coming to pick up his car. At the car park, he just collapsed and he passed away. Uh, and just last Saturday, we received news of um, one of our very dear, close friends, uh, Pastor Timothy Lowe. Some of you know Pastor Tim. He's the senior pastor of Every Nation Church. Uh, in Puchong, and of course, there's uh, 13 other branches of every nation, also two in Penang. Uh, Pastor Tim has spoken in our church, spoken in our Mandarin service, Mandarin church camp last year. Uh, Pastor Tim just had took a, a, a speaking engagement in another church. After finished speaking, having dinner together, laughing, joking, uh, and just collapsed and uh, could never be revived, even though there were three doctors in the church at the time of his passing. Somehow, <clears throat> death has been taking some of the dear ones one by one and it is pretty alarming and pretty overwhelming personally for me because each of these people are very dear, very close. Uh, it is like receiving news and being shocked, being overwhelmed by the news. It's just simply... Um, unbearable for anyone, I believe. So that's the reason why I think uh, it is good that we are being comforted by God and we need to be comforted. And how do we find that comfort? Because we will not be spared. Unfortunately, none of us in this room will be spared of news like that. But nevertheless, that does not make us to carry on life being defeated Wishful that such things will never touch us. Those are what we call wishful thinking. But how do we build ourselves so that we can face when such losses, such death, such uh, uh, things that are unexpected confronts us? And that's the message that Peter has for us. In the series that we have been doing on First Peter, we have now arrived to chapter 4 where the entire chapter is devoted in handling suffering. And so that's what I'm going to attempt to help to teach us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We pray that you will make the connection. This is your word, your life. And these are your precious people. Please make the connection beyond me, beyond my, my experience, beyond what I know. Make the connection to your people because you love your people. Do it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's ask the two individuals to come. Guys, come. I want to help, ask you to help me to... We've been in this series called Growing Securely in an Insecure World. Uh, media, can you show us the slide? 
And so this is the series, and we are in First Peter 4. And how will we attempt this topic called suffering? In chapter 3, verses 18 to 22, Peter will talk about the doctrine. He will speak about the doctrine. And so if I can show you, First Peter chapter 3, verse 18 to 22, speaks about the doctrine. What is the doctrine? It is the death, the suffering, sorry, the suffering, the death, the resurrection, and of course, ultimately, the victory of Christ. That is our doctrine. That is our belief. That is what we call the gospel, the good news, the death, burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, Paul lays the foundation of the doctrine, and then, moving to chapter 4, he now speaks about the practice which is verses 1 to 19. What is the practice? It is the way we live out our Christian life. Now, do you follow the way Peter crafts his message? He begins with the doctrine. Remember, our Bible is never divided into chapter and verses like how we see it today. But for reading and for, for convenient purposes, it has been divided with chapter and verses. It's a long letter. So he begins with the doctrine. He, he grounds us with the doctrine, the, the fundamentals that you need, a foundation, before you can actually live out the Christian life, the, practi the practice of your Christian life. But we don't want to look at the doctrine, but we want a quick fix. We want to have the solution when we are confronted with difficult, hard, challenging, or things like suffering. We do not know how to handle the practice of that issue without being grounded in the doctrine. Look, when Paul writes Colossians, four chapters, first two chapters is about doctrine. The last two chapters is about practice. When Paul, Paul writes Ephesians, it's the same. You know, six chapters, first three chapters is about doctrine. And the last three chapters is how you live out that doctrine into Christian practice. When you read the book of Romans, it's the same. You know, the first 11 verse chapters of the book of Romans is about the doctrine about what God has done, how He paid for our sins and how He rescued us. Then when it comes to chapter 12, we all know this verse and this chapter. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says that, Therefore, I beseech you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body. He never tells us to practice our Christian life until He grounds us in the doctrine. So likewise, this is what Peter is going to do in helping us to capture. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 to 19, it is the entirety of the whole practice of Christian living while we are in suffering. But so how we're going to see this is first six verses, not today. First six verses, we'll talk about the five aims of finding motivation in Christ. How by looking at Jesus, not going pick a boo with Jesus, Pick him, uh, see Him once in a while when we need... No, but really looking unto Jesus. And then the remainder of the verses will be the 4E of how we find encouragement. So, thank you so much. Doctrine, practice, very good. Thank you, guys. Now, yes, thank you. Now that we know how the verses plays out, so I'm going to use one verse to help us lay the foundation before the last week of this month, Pastor Rachel will attempt verses 1 to 6. So seeing Christ in our suffering is verse 1 to 6. Verse 7 to 11 is about Christian lifestyle in suffering. And what are some of the Christian lifestyle? Prayer, you know, hospitality, love, all those stuff. And then encouragement in suffering. Beginning from verse 12, I will focus on verse 12 just to lay the foundation. So I am just helping you to lay the foundation. How do we confront suffering? So that's how I'm going to help to finish my assignment this morning. And I pray that it will really help us to understand and capture all that God has for us. Now, uh, so let's take that one verse that I want to use, which is found in verse 12, which will be an encouragement. And then, when I attempt it in next month, and I will go into deeper in finding the four E's and how to find encouragement while we are suffering. So today, let's find that one verse first. The verse is, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Okay, I'm going to read for you that verse and pick up a few verses and we'll attempt to answer how we can be encouraged in our suffering. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal or trial that, you, that has come 
on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So what Peter is telling us, this is the foundation for me to unpack for you chapter 4. So I'm just going to touch on that one verse and unpack the, the, the chapter in the coming weeks. The question is, are you living surprised or are you living supplied? You will be a very miserable Christian if you are always living surprised. And that's what Peter said. Don't be surprised. If, if a fiery trial tests you, and don't consider it like something strange happening to you, why? Why, even, why must even Peter say that to us when he's talking about suffering? We all know when we get a shocking news, like we were having dinner together with a, a group of uh, pastors and uh, uh, some church members, and, you know, and then we received this news and we're like, oh, it's about Pastor Tim. And we were like, the shock, the, the you know, the, 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 the continual questions that keep coming back in our mind, like, how can? He's, he's younger than me. He's, but he's healthy. He's a, he's a good badminton player. I mean, just going through. Doesn't that sound like you're surprised? Yes. But we all will be surprised or shocked in the beginning. But will you remain surprised? Will you remain, you know, having no hope? Will you remain puzzled and, and, and uh, having a lot of doubt about God? Will, will you live that way? So this is what Peter is saying. Don't, don't be surprised when you go through this fiery trial that tests you uh, or, or think and uh, look at it as something strange is happening to you. Why must he say this? If you leave, when we leave this building at the end of this service, you will leave either surprised or supplied. My prayer is you will be supplied. Supplied with God's wisdom. Somebody say amen. amen. Supplied with God's understanding. Supplied with the, the, the picture of why and, and, and maybe not why, but what is next, God? Not just, you, you may not have the answer why, why this is happening. There are many things we do not know why. And, but maybe you will have an answer, what's next? How do we move on? Then you are supplied. If not, you will continually be surprised and I fear that you are going to be angry with God. And I fear you're going to be so upset with God. I pray that you will not. I pray you will leave supplied. Now, which will be your takeaway today? Surprised or supplied? I pray Holy Spirit will give us the wisdom to be supplied. Now, let me answer a few questions. Uh, one, let me answer this one question by giving you several answers. Not all questions have got one answer. Sometimes you need many answers in order, to, in order to prop up and solidify the reasoning for a question. Like this, how will I live if I'm always surprised by suffering? How will I live? What would be my lifestyle? How will I carry myself? How are my thought processes? How do I relate to other believers? How would I relate to God? How do I see this world that I'm living in? How do I look at the future if I'm always surprised? The word that Peter said is, guys, don't be surprised. Do you know that in the entire 1 Peter 1 and 2, the word suffering is mentioned 21 times. More than any other book in the Bible, the word surprise happens 21 times in this book, in the book of uh, 1 Peter uh, and, and 2 Peter. So, and, and if it's appearing 21 times and then he's telling you, don't be surprised, I'm sure you are surprised why he's telling you don't be surprised, aren't you? And I'm sure you want to have an answer so that you can walk away from here supplied. Pray that I will supply you that answer through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, now, so if you are surprised, I pray that's not the case. Now, this is how you will be if you're always surprised. Number one, you know, let me start with this story. Uh, this is the typical question people ask. Where is God when it hurts? 
Now, this is uh, Philip Yancey's book, latest book called The Question That Never Goes Away. Most of you know Philip Yancey. Philip Yancey, uh, God used him to write many amazing books. And one of the books that he wrote uh, is this called The Question That Never Goes Away. Why? All of us will ask if something bad were to happen to you, a suffering question props up and confronts you, the next thing is why? Why me? Why me, God? So, Philip Yancey was invited to speak in the Sandy Hooks Elementary School uh, community, which is in Newtown, Connecticut, in the United States. 20 children in the ages of 6 to 7 were gunned down, and six other adults died in that shooting. So, 28 people died. So, as Philip Yancey was on the phone with the people that were inviting him to come and speak to him. And, and at this moment, he was actually researching to write this book. He hasn't written the book yet. They wanted him to come and help them in the grief process, pain, suffering, talk about God, whatever that will help the people. While they were speaking on the phone, it dawned upon him something much harder for him to explain then this question, where is God when it hurts? All of us in this room would have that question. Where is God when it hurts the most? But then Philip Yancey said, while he was talking, this thought just runs through his mind. What if that we need to answer another bigger and more serious question? What if there is no God when it hurts? See, when you... When you, have no, when, when you say, where is God when it hurts? Meaning, yeah, he's somewhere. Probably with some explanation, you will probably know where he was. But it's worse when the question is, what if there is no God at all when it hurts? How do you tell people, give people hope? There are many, you know, uh, New York Times bestseller authors you know, like Richard Dawkins and many others who have been bestsellers. Why weren't they not invited to an event like this at the Sandy Hooks uh, shooting? Because probably they may say things like, well, folks, just pick up the pieces and move on. Because, um, you know, this is life. How do you help people when there is no God? That's why I'm happy being a pastor even though it's hard to comfort people when they lose a loved one, when suddenly shocking things like that, our words are not good enough. But at least we can tell them, there is a God. There is a God. You know the word atheist, someone who's an atheist, when somebody says, I'm an atheist, meaning they're saying the word atheist, a theos. A means no theos, is God. So there's, there's no God. Some are agnostic. Agnostic is a person who says, yeah, there's God, but, you know, how do you prove God? Maybe He's there somewhere, but you can't prove Him. Well, an agnostic maybe has some hope of believing in God. But an atheist, or if you're an atheistic author who doesn't believe in the existence of God, there's something much more difficult than, what if there is no God when it hurts? So, the first thing that you will do if you're always living surprised is this, number one. You will be lost in the gap between an infinite God and a finite human perspective. God who is infinite and we who are finite, somehow we, 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 cannot, we cannot grasp you know, the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding, the glory, the grandeur, the pomp and the goodness. You, you cannot, I cannot. But then we are, when we are lost, when this, this crisis hits us, we become so angry with God and we will forever be surprised. But I pray that when you are confronted with the finite human mind of yours and trying to relate to an infinite God, I pray the way you will connect the dots and connect the story will not be like, oh, he's, he's not good. Oh, he's, he's crazy. Oh, he's not thoughtful. Oh, he's, he doesn't love me. I, I pray you will not go that, go that way. But you will see that he's infinite. There are some things about him I may not understand, but he's still good. 
but it's still good. How, how, do, I, how do I help you to understand? Uh, may, maybe this video might help you. There was this young boy that was given this balloon or this kind of a ball that's really bouncy. Uh, sorry. Oops. Can somebody help me with that? Video, play. And so the ball was bouncy and he was, uh, you know, enjoying it, just three years old. And lo and behold, one day as he was enjoying it, not realizing mom doesn't know, family doesn't know, the door, front door was open and the ball was bouncing out of the front uh, entrance of the house and he wants to get the ball. All that his eyes can see is the ball and he's out there and he's on the main road right now and mom rushes and grabs the boy. He's saved, but the car comes and then splat, the ball goes. And the boy makes a conclusion. My mom has betrayed me. Can I take a vote? How many of you agree mom has betrayed the boy? Can I see your hand, please? Anybody? There's a few who are trying to attempt to vote that mom has betrayed them. We'll pray for them, okay? Now, we all know, we saw, we, we, were, we were the outside group that, were watch, that was watching what was going on. And mom actually saved the boy. Yes, the ball is gone. Yes, the ball is completely destroyed. But in the finite mind of a boy who's three years old, he cannot decipher, comprehend, or even make the, the, the ultimate purpose. Why was the ball destroyed? It's because he's thinking, if I could just run and get the ball before the car comes, I would have saved the day, saved the ball. Everybody will be happy, but he doesn't know the finite mind of his does not see like at that moment the infinite mind of the mummy who could save the day. How possible is it? There were things in your life when you miss the plane and you have to pay so much to buy back another ticket again. When you, when you were 19, 20 years old, when the girl walked away from your life and it was like the end of life for you, when it was so difficult, when, when you could not figure out why the death should happen, when you could not understand, if only you had sent them to a better hospital, bought them better medicine, gave them better treatment, if only, oh, maybe the infinite mind of God is, more, is greater than we, our finite mind, can ever capture. So I pray that as you uh, do this, see the difference between this, the gap that we have, that the Lord will help you to make the connection and help you to see. He is good like the mummy is good. Come on, somebody. Yes. Mom is good. Mom saved the day, but the kid doesn't see it. Is it possible that some of us here are like that? Right now? You, you, you cannot tell the reason why it happened. The why. Don't live for the why. I'll come to that in a short while. Don't live for the why. Second, the next thing we do, always leaving surprise, you know what we do? We tend to pin it all on sin to explain suffering. When you see something happen, ah, must be the sin. Nah. You just had an accident, then you ask, oh, oh, what sin did I commit that I should deserve such a mishap in my life? What sin did I commit that I lost my job? What sin was it that is so hidden? Why are we always going on a, on a wild goose chase, trying to pin everything on the problem of sin? Really? Well, let's ask Jesus now what He says. No, don't listen to me. You shouldn't. You know, if I were to just give you, just, just you know, pluck something out and say, no, 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 it's not because of all sin. Well, let's ask Jesus. Maybe He has the answer for us. You remember in John chapter 9, as He went along, He saw a man blind from birth. Blind from? Blind from birth. His disciples asked him this question. Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? Now, follow me. He was born blind from birth. And they asked him, who sinned? He, this, he was born blind. When did he sin? Because there is a, a rabbinical thinking that it is possible that at conception that a child could be rebellious in the womb. So that's why Jesus didn't say, you, are you dumb or what? Jesus didn't go after them. Are you that crazy? 
I didn't you just know that he was born blind from birth? No, he was. So they were asking the question, why? And neither, and I love Jesus' answer. He said, Who was whose sin is this? The boy's sin or the parent's sin, right? We all like to ask. Why is the kid born like this? Uh, if you know, huh? Uh, they all did some sinful things. Huh? Easy. Put all the problem on sin. Now I, I want to ask, why do we need to have an explanation? Why? Because we feel good, right? Oh, I have an answer. I know why. I'll just avoid this in my life. So I won't experience this. Really? You kidding me? Is it possible? How good are we to the point that we can avoid it? So that's why people put pin, pin everything on sin. And Jesus said, neither. Neither. You remember Luke chapter 13? Another example in Luke chapter 13. Now, there were some present at the time when, when, who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with the sacrifices. And Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? So they were a group of Galileans. They said, come on, they come to temple, no, to bring their offering and uh, to sacrifice. But this, this um, ruler of the land decided that he's going to catch them, punish them, take their offering, mix their own blood with their sacrifice. Pilate was like crazy. This is what we call a moral sin. And he committed this against these people. And Jesus asked, okay, you guys heard about this story, right? So, who's, you think, do you think those guys were worse sinners than the, all those who are still alive? I'm so happy the answer Jesus gave. And he said, no! So he moved from moral sin to a natural disaster. Another problem, another crisis. What was the crisis? Then he gave, on the same chapter 13, he said, do you know of the Tower of Siloam? It fell and killed 18 people. And he asked the question, do you think, and I'm asking all of us here, do you think that the tower that fell and killed the 18, the ones who died, the 18, are worse sinners than those that are still alive? Because we will say, oh, no, no, the first one is different. First one, they were in the temple, you know, so close to God and they died. Surely the terrible people, they must have a lot of sin in their life. And Jesus said, no. And then he goes on to say, Why did, what about the tower? Oh, tower, that one is a natural disaster. Lah. Like tsunami, like earthquake, eh, anybody can happen. But he asked, do you think those guys are worse sinners than those who are still alive? And I'm so glad he said no. Why? Because we cannot pin everything on sin. Yes, there's a sin and there's, a, there's an effect of the fall that has come upon mankind from the, from the fall of Adam and all the things that we are seeing, the decaying of the world, the decaying of the... Of the, of the uh, the atmosphere, the decaying of the creation of God, all. And Paul writes it, writing in Romans chapter 8 says that how the creation is longing for the redemption. He's talking, yeah, the, the creation is, is decaying. But that doesn't mean that all the things happen in your life, the bad things happen, is because you sin. Because nobody will be standing today if God were to count every one of them for every failure that we... So sometimes it's easy to pin everything on sin. Number three, what will we do if we are thinking about being surprised? I use the backward approach to explain suffering instead of a forward approach. So the typical question is, like what Philip Yancey wrote in his book, the questions that never end. Why God? Why? I don't know, is anybody here in this room asking this question? Why? God, why? And it has been the last five years you haven't stopped asking the question. That means you are still living surprised. Not supplied. Supra su surprised. Cannot what? I'm from a good family, what? We pray a lot, what? You know, we my father is a pastor. What? Oh, my great grandfather is the greatest evangelist. What? You know, he won all the Eskimos to Jesus. No? Oh, it's great. No? How come this thing happened? What honestly? Do we expect a privileged treatment from God because we served Him? 
Hello. Why? Are we saying that he deserved to give us a privileged treatment just because we gave a lot of money to church? Because I served, I gave up my life. My, my 37 years of my life, my adult life, I laid down to serve Jesus. Oh, Jesus should treat me very differently. Why do I have this sense of entitlement in my life when I relate to God? Why? Why? So Jesus tell them, guys, it's the same. He said, unless, unless you have a relationship with God, that's what Jesus said to the Tower of Siloam and what Pilate did, unless you have a relationship with God and you trust God, unless you have a relationship, the same thing can happen to anybody. We cannot walk around with a sense of entitlement. So when we ask the word why, we are saying, you must give me an explanation. I don't know why, folks. I don't know why people die before their time. I don't know. All we can know is that God's given us all a race to run. And we must be faithful to run the race. And run the race and finish the race. But we may not... We all are going to die one day. Pastor, don't talk about dying. Sunday afternoon, Pastor. Yes, I know. I remember it's Sunday. I know we are going to die. Only different time, Onila. Right? So should we be given a special treatment? Why? Because of what we did for Him? But God remembers all the things you have done for Him. He has not forgotten, please. But that should not be the weighing principle how you are treated in a fallen and a sick world like that, the world that we are living in. Tsunami still hit Christians. Earthquake still hit Christians. Just because we are Christian doesn't mean the sky should not rain down on us. As you are walking on the streets of Penang after this, everywhere raining except you, there's a cloud that covers you. <laughs> Brother, I am running to that cloud because there's a favor in you. I do not know how you bought it, my friend. You are the man. I'd love to know more about it. Do you know that the, we use this backward, you know, uh, why? why? Every time you ask why, you are going backward. But instead, forward is, Lord, what's next? Mary and, and that's what happened when Jesus, they asked, whose fault? Is it the father, mother's sin or the boy's sin who's blind? Do you know Jesus never answered the question? He never goes, waste time answering the why. He straight away told them, uh, so that God will be glorified in all this. He never waste time on the why. He went straight to the what's next. God will be glorified in all of it. And then, Mary, uh, Jesus talked to uh, Mary and Martha, and they said, but why did my, you should have come earlier, Jesus. If you came earlier, my brother would not have died. If only you came earlier, my brother wouldn't have died. See, they were still going back to their why. Why did you come late? If only you came earlier. You know what Jesus said? He never spent time talking about the why. He went and said, this death will not end. Just as you see it, it will end with the glory for God. It will end with the glory for God. Do you know that many deaths that happen in our, in our church, as a pastor, and I'm sure Pastor Bernard, Pastor Rachel, each one of them have seen this challenge of walking with the members who have lost their loved one, unexpected, and but then at the end of the day, you see the story. Many stories unfolding at the end of it. I've seen so many unfolding right before the member's life. At the point when the death happened, it's like the end of the world. You know, a wife, you know, losing her, her daughter. Then a few months later, a few, one year later, losing the husband. It's like, what? How? But you see the hand of God. And how God is glorified in all of it. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. So, um, Jesus never spent time talking about and explaining the why, but always what's next. What's next? The glory, the glory that they will receive. The glory. Do you know, when the plane hit the World Trade Center on September 11, 21, 2001. Uh, 
It was a very tragic moment. More than 3,000 over people died. The, the death was something almost like the, the tragedy of Pearl Harbor for the nation of the United States. It was such a horrible event. And so people asked this question, where was God? Why didn't He stop those terrorists from getting into the car drive? Why didn't God create a traffic jam in New York City? Why didn't God, you know, divert to that? Why didn't, why didn't the customs pick up? Why didn't the immigration office? How is it that God never stopped? Where was God? The question goes on. Where was God? Someone gave a very brilliant answer to this question. Where was God? When the terrorists went into the aeroplane, took the plane, hijacked it, learned how to fly the plane and crashed into the tower and brought down the two towers. Where was God? And someone said this, you know where was God? You really want to know where God was? God was in the hearts of over 240 firefighters. When the tower was collapsing and people were jumping out because of hopelessness and death is so imminent and so real and so gripping, when everybody was rushing out of a burning building, 240 over brave firefighters were rushing into the building. You want to know where God is? God was in the hearts of all those brave men and women who laid down their life. God was still working. But you only see one thing. Where was God? God should have protected there. We will never see the redemptive act of God. And that's why the name of Jesus is called He's a Redeemer. He redeems. Because He's, he's martyr and He's circumvent better than the devil could ever do. He is much better. That's why, uh, please, don't ever put God and the devil and the evil on the same platform. You, you cannot. Because God is much bigger. He is much bigger. If God is good, we ask this question. This is, this is called the question of theodicy. Theodicy is the word theos, which is God, and dyke, which means justice. How do you justify God? If God is God, how do you justify Him? For example, if God is good, He's good, huh? How many of you believe God is good? But why he let bad things happen? Why it happened? Suffering happened. Ah, he's good, ma. So lovey-dovey. But then, he cannot stop the suffering. He must be a God, ah, who's so weak, lah. Good only, but cannot do, stop the suffering. He is so weak. I don't even believe this God. That's how people make conclusion. Wrong justification for God. Number two, God is so great and powerful. But why he never stop the bad suffering from happening? Ah, he doesn't care, lah. Strong only got muscle and he cannot do anything. Cannot stop the evil. Ah, God is bad. Like, he doesn't care about you. Like. See how we make the justification about God? This is an is arm of, 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 of religious psycholo- uh, uh, philosophy where you explain why God works the way He works. Why? If God is good, God is great, He is what we call benevolent, he is omnipresent, He's everywhere. He's omniscient, He's all-knowing. He's omnipotent, He's all-powerful. When God is all dead, but why does He allow the evil from happening? Because God is sovereign. Because God is above all this that you just mentioned, sir. He's above. That's what makes Him sovereign. That means even though the bad can happen, but God is still sovereign. He's above all of it. When you see God that way, that He's sovereign, not just strong, but why this? Not just a good, but why still let the suffering? Either God is good, or God don't care, or God is weak. We make the conclusion, but we never see that God is bigger than all. Because God is sovereign. That means even through that bad, you can still see God's hand. No wonder Jake, Joseph can stand in front of the brothers who actually almost murdered him. But because of the good, good heart of Reuben, they, Joseph was spared. And he's standing in front of all these guys who wanted him dead. And he can tell them, guys, you intended evil. But God, but God intended good for me. It is not just the why, it's what's next. I think that's how we should see the world that we are living in. I want God to remove evil completely. This is funny. I want God to remove evil completely. Really? 
Lord, remove the evil completely. How, does, how will God remove evil? Okay, block evil 100% from the world. Okay, maybe I might consider. Number two, change people's personality so that they stop them from doing evil. Huh. Okay, then God will have to create a lot of robots around. Uh, or maybe God, let's do this. Let's remove all the evil people from planet Earth. Okay, let me see. If God were to remove all the evil people, okay. Uh, I don't, probably I don't need glasses to see. I think this whole room will be empty. Yeah. Evil based on who? Evil based on whose, whose interpretation evil? Oh, I don't steal. Oh, I, I don't cheat. Oh, I don't, um, you know, I, I don't do other things that the terrorists do. They bomb, they maim, they kill. I, I don't do. Wow. You just exposed yourself. <laughs> I just exposed myself with my self-sufficient, self-righteousness. It's a sin. I am evil. You know, Jesus told the, the, the Pharisees, they said, they walk with long flowing robe. They say long prayer. And he told them, you are like a dead man's, dead man's bones, you know. Your, your tombstone is all white, but inside it's all, it's all corrupted dead man's bones. I mean, he's talking to about the religious guys who claim to pray long, who claim to have very nice outlook of themselves. <laughs> Pretty scary. Evil based on who? If God really wants to remove evil, none of us will be in this earth, including this guy who's been talking non-stop for the last 40 minutes. That's me, sir. Because in the eyes of God, we all are sinners. But by the grace of Jesus Christ, we are saved. Can I give you one ex an ex answer for this? God don't remove evil, but God overcomes evil. How? At the cross. How does He overcome evil? Because He overcome evil at the cross by overcoming the power of sin. When I become a Christian, you know what? I fight sin. I, I don't want to live in sin anymore. I used to be a murderer. I used to be a rapist. I used to be a thief. I used to be, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a problem, a trouble to the society. But I stopped because of the cross. That's why God doesn't take evil away from us. But He removes evil at the cross by overcoming the power of sin in our life. So when the power of sin is broken, I tell you this will be a better world, lah. The world will be a better place. But please, don't ask God to remove evil because you and I will not be here at all. Finally, we conclude that there is no God. This is what we say. I know why. Because there is to totally no God in this world. Psalm 110.4 says, The wicked are too proud to seek God. They seem to think that God is dead. Worship team can come. They seem to think that God is dead. The wicked. A New York Times columnist said this. Her name is Susan Jokowi. No relation to President Jokowi in Indonesia. She said this, I find solace, I find comfort in disbelief in a God. Why? She says, I don't think God exists. Why? If I see a shivering homeless man in New York City, the harshness of the condition, though she feels sorry for the homeless, but it comforts me knowing you know why these problems are happening? Ah, very easy lah. Because there is no God. That's why all this problem is happening. How do we even make that conclusion? If you say there is evil, it's because you are making a comparison evil to good. If you say in an exam hall, a guy gets 90, another student gets 60, another student gets 45, and you grade them as A plus, C or D, whatever you give. Why do you do that? Because you are comparing with what? Comparing with 100. That's why you can give 90, 40, 60, because you are comparing with 100. When you say about evil, it's because you are comparing with God. Why do people say God doesn't exist? Because they see evil. How can? It doesn't make sense. If I say God doesn't exist because I see evil, why do you even say there's evil? Because there's a God. That's why you can say it's evil. I say this is white because I know there's something called black. Hello. We conclude there's no God because we think God doesn't exist. So, are you surprised? Are you supplied? How will you leave this building? It's very important. Because if you live surprised all your life, I am worried for you as your believer. 
You'll be angry when God doesn't answer your prayer, really, you know? You'll be angry why God never answered my prayer. Do you know, I, as a pastor, I've heard so many Christians leave their faith or backslidden because God never answered prayer. You know, we need to live beyond our needs, you know. And David gave us a beautiful example in Psalm 23. He said how? The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. Relationship. I don't have any need. Relationship, need. You know what we do? We switch. We put need first. Need. He must, then I will believe Him. He must provide, then I believe Him. God has just become like a vending machine. We put some coins, punch a few buttons, and He gives us what he, we ask for. Do you know when we live that way? Oh, it's a miserable Christian life. Lah. We are still in kindergarten, sorry to say, but that's how it is. God is like a Santa Claus who just have to come and reward us for all the good that we have done. Let me tell you, when you see and live like David, I'm not saying your needs are not important. Please don't get me wrong. Huh? You don't say to, to me, hey, well, Pastor, you don't, you mean, don't have, I have need. All of us have need. Is there anybody in this room don't have need? Please, after service, please lay and pray for me. I'll be happy. <laughs> you, are, you are the man. I don't think you're human like you are some angel lost in planet Earth. Right? How can it be you don't have any need? Huh? David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Relationship. If I have relationship, needs doesn't bother me. It doesn't. Because you know why? Because of the relationship, I'm satisfied in Him. He may not give all that I ask for, but I know He's good. I know He's sovereign. I know He's faithful. I think we need to come to that place. If not, you walk out this building surprised always. Not supplied. Not supplied. Can I read that scripture one more time? Beloved. You see how Peter writes? He writes with the word beloved. You are the beloved of God. He's telling them, guys, you are the beloved. God loves you. How can He think evil of you? How can He forget you? How can He abandon you? How can He see you as you are not important? How can He be weak for you? How can, be, how can He become one who doesn't worry about you? No, he, you are His beloved. And don't think it's strange, something that you, yeah, that you, like, you never seen things happening before. Concerning the fiery, why does he use the word fiery? Because July 16, July 16, AD, 64 AD, Nero the emperor, Peter was writing with Emperor Nero as the king. Nero the emperor started burning Rome. He asked for funds from Senate. Senate refused to give him money to rebuild and to change Rome. So what he did was, he started this fire that went on for nine weeks. And people were upset, people were angry with the emperor. Two historians have proven it was Nero who started the fire. But you know what Nero did? Brilliant political strategies. You go for the people who are the lowest and most problematic. Who? The Christians. La. Who else? Because they don't want to worship the God that the Romans put up. And they live differently. Blame them. From that point, 200 years have gone by. Christians have gone through persecution unendingly until Constantine became the, the, the emperor of Rome and instituted Christianity as the official religion. 200 years, you know. Rome was burning. Peter knows. It's fiery trial. Which is to try you. We all think, uh, trying is bad. God is trying me. Why must He try me? You never say your teacher is bad when, you, when he or she gives you an exam. How many of you think your teacher is bad when she gives you an exam? Some of you are probably not putting up your hand because you just want to be kind to me, right? The students are put, that's not, yesterday, last week, yesterday they put up their hands. Uh, some of you are putting up your hands. Uh, yeah, my teacher bad. You know what exams are? Exams are good because it tells you what you have learned and what you have not. It tells you the true self of who you are as an individual. Whether you are ready for the next level or not. That's what exams are for. La. Whether you're ready for next level. How can you sit for, for A, I mean, A levels when you have not even finished your standard six? You're struggling with standard six, you want to finish it. I mean, come on, it just tells you. So when God try you, it's because He wants to not punish you, but purify you purify you 
as though something strange had happened. The word happened there is what you know, it's, it's like suddenly happened without any control. It's not. God is in control. God is in control. What are you going through right now in your life? Finance? Broken marriage? Broken relationship? An unhappy relationship? Failed business? What are you going through? Lost someone in death? Lost someone in sickness? Just got the news about how that you, your family member has been diagnosed with something that is really worrying? Are you nursing a, someone who's sick at the point of death right now? I pray, church, nobody leaves this room being surprised but supplied. Supplied in Jesus. Father, I thank you for your church. Peter called us as beloved. You are looking down from heaven at the beloveds of God right here. God, I ask that you will speak, bring hope, and help us to be like David who said, the Lord is my God, my shepherd, my faithful king, the lover of my soul. The Lord is my saviour. The Lord is my healer. The Lord is my Messiah. I shall not be in one, Lord. I don't, I don't have any need. Because you so overwhelm me that my needs doesn't overwhelm me anymore. So Lord, I pray, let your people leave this building. I pray, this is my prayer. Oh God, that we will not be surprised, but the word spoken will mean that we are supplied in Jesus Christ. We are supplied. We are the beloved of God. Father, I pray your blessing over your people. Thank you, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people say, Amen. Give Him praise, someone. Come on, everybody. Let's stand and... I want to pray for people all over this room. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you something and you are being ministered to right now, you've been living surprised all this life, all this time, it's possible that you are upset and angry with God. The traits of a person with a surprise mentality will be manifested by anger, frustration, distrust against God. I pray today it ends all in Jesus' name. Because today you are supplied with the truth. God is sovereign. He's great. He's good. I don't understand why my husband left me. Why my, my, my baby died. I don't understand why my child born this way. But God, you are sovereign, oh God. You are sovereign. Oh God, I pray. Supply your people, Father. Let them know that they are beloved of yours. Church, listen. I want to pray for you. If that's you, would you just lift your hands and receive from the Lord? Just lift your hands and say, Lord, I receive. I receive a revelation. Receive the supply. The supply from heaven. Oh God, the Lord demands, but grace will always supply in Jesus' name. God supplies for you in Christ. He supplies for you in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift your hands. Remember Peter. He denied Jesus three times. This is the Peter who wrote this book. I'm sure Peter understands when he says, Beloved, do not be surprised when you go through trial. Why? Because Peter knows in Luke chapter 22, Verse 16. And the third time when Peter denied Jesus and the cock crow. And the Bible says in verse 60, Jesus from a distance looked at Peter and Peter ran out of the building and wept bitterly. Why? It was not a look of condemnation. It was not a look of judgment. It was not a look of punishment. No, it was a look. Peter, I still love you. When you are well, encourage your brethren, look. And this is what he's doing. He's writing the book for us to let us know when Jesus looked at me, he wasn't punishing me. He wasn't judging me. He looked at me with love and hope. And that's why he can write, Beloved, do not be surprised. EPCC, as you leave this building, 
I pray this week will be a week of deliverance for you. It'll be a week of freedom for you. No more angry with God. No more bitter with God. Because you are His beloved. How can He hurt you? How can He forget you? He looked at Peter. Luke writes to us. Luke's gospel is called the social gospel. He looks at Peter because Peter is so special. Not judgment, not hatred, not bitterness. No, no. Oh, Peter, you forgot me. Thanks a lot, Peter. No, Peter, I still love you. That's why Peter can write this book. He's looking at you today. You are his beloved. Lift your hands. Let me pray. Father, all over this room, you see people who are going through some kind of suffering. Some kind of things they cannot answer, cannot understand, cannot know why the healing doesn't come, doesn't know why the, the relationship doesn't materialize, why the job doesn't seem to be changing course, why the finances are not coming. Oh God, I pray right now, let your people be supplied in Jesus' name. Not surprised, supplied from heaven, Lord. The gap between the finite and infinite will close today. In Jesus' name, the gap will close today, Lord. In Jesus' name, I bind every lies of the devil. I break the lies of the enemy. I bind every wicked scheme spoken against your people. Today, let your people leave this building free in Jesus' name. Freedom in the name of Jesus. Blessing in the name of Jesus. Supplied in the name of Jesus. Supplied in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, your goodness is running up. It's running up to me. Hallelujah. No one like you. No one like you, God. So, Robo Kuntadala Rabba Soto. Thank you, Father. Lord, thank you. We can go home supplied. And I pray nobody, Lord, I know. I'm asking the impossible, but Lord, all things are possible with you, God. That's why I ask. Let everyone in this room go home. Supplied in Jesus' name. Supplied in Jesus' name, God. Do it, Father. Because this is what you do best, Lord. You do the impossible, Lord. Bless your people. Bless this church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. God bless you all, church. If you need prayer, please come. We are happy to pray for you. We are happy to pray. Please come. We are happy to pray. Our leaders are in front waiting.